I am Groot. We are Groot. Is this how we're going to start this thing? What does that have to do with anything related to the topic? <laughs> Did someone buy the, the, the Blu-ray? We just got a full brand of movies from the year we're not even talking about anymore. Can, can, I, can, I, can I have some of that Marvel <laughs> money? You, wait, was this a paid advertisement for the for the Blu-ray of Guardians of the Galaxy? Give me some of that Marvel money, Mike. <laughs> yeah, look, I'm just gonna keep that for myself, Matt. Thank you. <laughs> no more more money for you. <laughs> yeah, I I just saw Guardians of the Galaxy, all right. So I was just like, fucking wow. a. It has Big Hero 6 on it. Look, here's Brendan Fraser. <laughs> <laughs> Was he even in the Marvel movie? <laughs> He's really very thorough in its movie. <laughs> anyway. Disney. I'll, I'll give you Star Wars. Here, I got it. I'll I got give you Disney it. money. Here. <laughs> I got, I, got, I got this this week. Can I have some of this money? <laughs> Give me some of that Thief in the Cobbler money. Ron. Money for everybody. Hey. Uh. Make it rain. Wally. Alright. We get the point. I have to bring out my whole Disney collection. <laughs> Here it is, guys! Look! I got this one, this one, this one, this one, this one! <laughs> oh, man. What are we here for again? There can be only one. I have come here to chew bubblegum and kick ass. All out of bubblegum. Go ahead. Make my day. Cinema Royale. Hello, and welcome to Cinema Royale. I'm your host, Mike. Along with me are my esteemed colleagues of film. First up, we got Matt, also known as Animat. Hello. What's up, guys? Hello, Gopnach. Royal. I'm ready. And... What have we got for us today? It's going to be an interesting podcast, that's for sure. I Especially the movies we're going to talk about. And last but not least, Jada Jada. Not least indeed. And I would like to take this opportunity to say that it is a great honor to be here and to promote Darkwing Duck. First half of the first season. You should all go out and buy it today. Support your local mouse. Mickey is love. Mickey is life. I'll do it. Wait a minute, I just realized something. I should be getting the most money out of this. I'm wearing a freaking Mickey Mouse t-shirt! You should be getting all the you should give me all the money because you have twenty seven thousand subscribers on YouTube, Matt. Come on. Yay. God. You didn't have to do that. Channel. All I've got on my shirt is Rob Zombie. <laughs> I don't think the mouse appreciates that. <laughs> you just Did you do anything to no? No. Could you ma- could you imagine Rob? Rob- could you imagine if you directed a Disney movie? Oh my god. Or like a Marvel movie or something? Oh man. Oh my god. No, like he he should do like I can imagine like Rob Zombie doing some kind of movie like Alexander and the No Good, Crappy, Holy Bad, Terrible Day. Is Spawn Marvel? No. I don't That's I... that's image. I don't think so. Like, uh, that's just like a Todd McFarlane thing. Yeah, it's not uh, a Marvel character. Maybe he could do a decent Ghost Rider. You know? Mm, maybe. Oh. Well, yeah. yeah, but then first we need to get that image of Nicolas Cage out, out of the way. Nah, nah, they... nah, nah. Get Nicolas Cage back, man, for the third <laughs> one. <laughs> we need to get Nicolas Cage freaking out the door. Anyways, this is our 
flashback December, and we're gonna go back ten years ago to 2004. What a what a interesting year in film. My two films has a theme to it. I kind of have a theme to it. I do too. It's called They Came Out in the Same Year. <laughs> All right. Amazing. I just it could be accidental. It just sort of happened. Like I could roll with this. <laughs> it works. It it, it works perfectly. The same Oscars. So, uh, I'm gonna go first, and we're gonna go around in, uh, almost circle. Um, triangle. It's like a triangle. So, <laughs> Jason's with us today, by the way. If you haven't noticed, he is busy tonight, so he couldn't be able to come tonight. Hey, Rob Zombie will be playing the part of James. <laughs> so... <laughs> Tonight's broadcast is brought to you by Halloween. The two movies I directed. <laughs> Halloween. He's done other You're stuff. The haunted world of El Super Bisto, then. Okay. <laughs> Close enough. I don't know. So those are the only three Rob Zombie movies I know he made. Oh man, I think. He He's done a lot you know, more. I think the Devil's might have been in 2004. I could have picked that, but I didn't. Hold on, I can check that, actually. It's well, appropriate, too. Matt is going to be our fact checker tonight. Tell, tell us what... No! Oh, 2005. Oh. oh. okay. Yeah, there seems to be a, a running oh, thing with that, too. I, I almost had an almost theme. In oh. My So, so last night I started to watch my films, and uh, my lord, the last film I watched is the a doozy. Two thousand and four brought us Oliver Stone's Alexander. Oh yes, I remember. the biopic about Alexander the Great. I haven't seen it. <sighs> Thank goodness you haven't. That was one hell of a weird movie. It, it, oh my god. Why? How weird can it be? It's it's pretty a, weird. It's, 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 it's the vampire hunter. I can't see how a biopic it's, really. it's It's a historical biopic. and <sighs> Oh boy. Um, so Colin Farrell plays uh, Alexander. A, a blonde Alexander. He doesn't look good in blonde. But uh, uh, he overacts. He, 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 this whole film is overacted. It, it's over the top. Over the top. The, the emotions are, I mean, if there's a serious part, sure, they can emote and be serious, and you can feel for that part. But when they yell, and they, like, there's drama. It's huge. It's like Gordon Ramsay level of drama. It's like yelling, screaming over the top, and I'm like, whoa, wait, wait a minute. It's like a soap opera. I'm trying to conquer this country. You ain't bloke. <laughs> then you got... It's an awesome movie. I don't know what you guys are talking about. <sighs> plus, no, it, plus... It's pl Colin Farrell. Not Gordon Ramsay. No, it's, it's Colin Farrell. Although Fer it would help. Colin Farrell's not... I have tried to appreciate Colin Farrell as an actor. He, the only thing he's done that's good is Horrible Bosses. Any other film I've seen with him, it's just like, what the fuck, dude? Can you act? Well, but dude, dude, the guy is actually really good in uh, Saving Mr. Banks. I can tell you that. Oh, good. Thanks for telling me. He was the he was the dad, like the uh, like P.L. Travers' real dad. So Oliver Stone, you may know him. He's directed Wall Street, the sequel. Um, goddamn, I can't think of it right now. But. I but this this film is like his own Blade Runner because th he's done many versions of it. He's there's a theatrical cut, there is a director's cut, there's the ultimate cut. It's like, whoa! It's like there's too many versions. That, I got the theatrical version, but this is ridiculous because it's I got a two disc DVD set, and I assume 
the whole movie's on one disc, right? Right? You you expect the whole movie to be on one fucking disc. I'm watching the first disc and I'm like, okay, uh, eh, okay, and all of a sudden it says to be continued in the second disc, and I'm like, what the fuck? I gotta put the second there, disc in. There are a lot of movies that are on more than one disc. Lord of the Rings, Hamlet, Lord of the Rings and Two Towers. Yeah, that's why you need like that's why blue ma- Blu-rays are made to have bigger capacities like that. That's kind of the thing that I should try to get into more because I am definitely have more DVDs than I should have. Blue, Blu-rays, it's just. <laughs> what you can do is something. What I do is that I try to get like combos. Like if if whenever I can, I just get like DVDs and Blu-rays. So. But Ange- here. Angelina Jolie is in this film. So, in contrast, this year she was in Maleficent. Ten years ago, she was in Alexander playing the queen. And she is devious in this film. She's She's got like a Prussian accent going on. And she's very conceiving when it comes to Alexander, her son. And she's trying to like, you, you can't marry this woman. And she's not our blood. She's not, she's just a hill girl. You just, it's, she's like out there and... Just he wants to authoritative. break the rules of love. He doesn't want to marry his sister. He wants to marry some other girl. But mo- and it just the the battles in this thing are they they are epic. But it's just if you don't like animal cruelty in films, this one has a lot of sh- bloodshed when it comes to animals. Oh dear. Like. Anthony Hopkins is in this film. He pretty much narrates the whole movie. He he tells what's going on with Alexander's life and he mentions about, you know, they go to India and they see monkeys and they like they don't know what monkeys are. They're so they're killing monkeys thinking about their tribes of humans and I'm like what the fuck? Speaking of animal cruelty, my dog needs to be let out. It would be cruel of me. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, all right. No, but I like it's been a while since I've seen Alexander, but there are a few things that I've remembered. Like not a lot, but there are some things I remember. Number one, it's freaking long. It, it is. is it, and, way too long. And the other cuts are. Because the longer cuts, the longer cuts are even longer. It's just longer like. Longer cuts. It's unbelievable, cause um. The theatrical version is 175 minutes. Yeah, that's all. That's pretty much five minutes away from three hours. But then the director's cut is 167 minutes. That's shorter, good. But then we go a little further. The final cut is 214 minutes. Jeez, false. But then the ultimate cut got cut down to 206 minutes. So, because I guess the... Um, historians are like, uh, Oliver Stone has not fully developed the story correctly. You know, there's some things that are out of order or something. I've not paid attention to that. I was like, the story's fine, I guess. I mean, then you got Vel Kilmer as the father. Uh, imagine that, Vel Kilmer and Angelina Jolie as parents. <laughs> what the f- I- <laughs> What? <laughs> what of them uh- you mean like imagine them like with kids, or imagine them like as parents together? As parents together. Oh. It's oh. like I oh, I wasn't expecting Vel Kilmer or Angelina Jolie to hook up in you know movie. It's like I mean Vel Kilmer's got like one eye missing, so he's got like a scar, and he's just like hamming it up. It's it's very over the top and hammy. Normally I like that, but this is just That's way okay. overboard. It's a. It's supposed to be a historical biopic, and it's. I I can see this being played in a history class or something. Just uh, mm-hmm. and the, but it's like you're trying to teach a lesson, and it it doesn't really teach you a lot. I mean, it's over the top and really not. And mind you, the same year, uh, Troy came out with Brad Pitt, which yes. was, and I, if I knew this film ahead of time, I would have watched it and did a double feature with Alexander to compare, but. I didn't do that, and it's too bad Angelina Jolie didn't be in Troy. 
<laughs> yeah, I actually, I actually watched Troy much more than I did Alexander. That, like, I will admit, it's, it's like as a movie, it is okay. Although, funny enough, <laughs> where Angel, where Alexander has Angelina Jolie, Troy has Brad Pitt, and like he's pretty much shown as this. Like I remember, he he was this badass, and mostly Achilles. it tells the story. Of, uh, yeah, it tells the story of um, of Troy, where like the people with the horses are the bad guys. So it's from the other point of view, and um, it's kind of a confusing plot. Some of the acting is not that good, especially with Orlando Bloom playing as a freaking wimp. <laughs> like, tr- trust me, this is not I the like. I kind of see Orlando Bloom playing. Yeah, like, he's not the Legolas or Will Turner that you guys would remember. He was a freaking wimp. He would back away from battles. He's freaking pitiful. I mean, yeah. yeah. Range? Variety? Yeah. I remember, actually, the story that, from what I've heard, is that I think there was, like, there was, a dis- like, a natural disaster that happened in the set of Troy that, like, I don't know if it was a flood or a twister or something like that. Yeah, it didn't, like, somebody get injured like brett yeah, and brett like, pitt it really got... screwed up with the set yeah well and i was just thinking about that i was like wait this is 2004 this was like a year before they actually met and of course i got mr and mrs smith where they actually met and fucking fell in love so it's like one year guys you got you could have just fell in love and just mm, ah. could have gone could have gone with a greek theme you know yeah but no nah gotta be spies for crying out loud but by the way going back to alexander another thing that i remember the most is somehow this one scene and it's an, a really over the top scene where i kid you not uh, i think you would remember this mike someone got hugged to death <laughs> yes 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 it was like i think it was like like i think it was either like anthony hopkins or christopher Plummer. like they were giving a hug and then this one guy was like he was hugging him so much, and then they dropped dead. Oh, I know what you're talking about. That that scene alone was... It's weird how they set that up, though. They're, like... They're cutting back between um, Alexander doing his shtick, conquering stuff, and then he, they cut back, like, eight years ago, where uh, Alexander's talking to his father, Vel Kilmer, and he's, like, Vel Kilmer's the king, and he's walking in, and all of a sudden he's like... I should come in there with you. And so the guy hugs him, sticks out a knife, and pokes him and kills him. Oh. So you didn't see the knife go in. Yeah. <laughs> it's just, it looks weird from my perspective. I didn't see the knife. It, it looks like... like that to happen, though. Like a big strong guy hugs a person and just crushes him in his face. <laughs> you get crushed. Is that it's... Really kind of reminds me of SpongeBob. I was like, Backstore on the strong! Strong! I saw it was it was in an episode of Justice League where all the Justice League members were like facing their biggest nightmares in their heads or something. Uh-huh. Nightmare was like powers of hug people, and the result was being like way too strong, and so he like gave Jimmy Olsen a hug and he totally crushed Jimmy Olsen dead in his arms. <laughs> Jimmy, I'm sorry. Crappy, <laughs> consider that's a kid show. Like from Parks and Network. Wait, oh wait, did you say Justice League or Justice Friends? Justice League. Oh, okay. What's huh. Justice Defense? You never saw Dexter's Lab, did you? Oh, you mean the superhero team? I, they yeah. weren't actually Dexter's Lab. I watched Dexter's Lab for Dexter and Dee Dee in the lab, okay? okay. The superhero yes. stuff is okay. It's like, it's like the stuff with... It's a nice side thing. It's like the stuff with the pig in the farmhouse on Garfield and Friends. You don't really give a crap about... Them. Yeah, <laughs> true. True, true. Yeah, there's there's like the, the final battle that Alexander goes into, and it's really weird because I'm thinking, I'm watching this, I'm like, wait, why do they do this? He gets like stabbed, and everything goes red, like it goes into this red t- like tone, and it's like, it's like, what the hell am I seeing? It's like it should be like the vision through Malcolm's uh, Alexander's eyes, and they that or some of the blood got spilled on the camera. It, it seemed like it. it was like there was red everywhere and I was like what wait so this happened like did everybody see red all of a sudden for fuck's sake I'm like I'm and I'm dozing off too at this point because it's, it's a long ass movie it's like I wasn't expecting it to be that long and 
like I said, monkeys get killed a little bit before they like, oh, it's like a little primate. Oh, it's a, it's a hairy mat. And... <laughs> Did you just say a hairy mat? A hairy mountain? I heard mountain. I heard Matt. Like Matt with an Australian accent. A hairy mountain, mate. Because <laughs> that's a hairy Matt. Because he's very hairy. <laughs> that's right, baby. I'm like a hairy mountain. <laughs> you see these two peaks? <laughs> if... Alexander is this complicated mess of a movie. If you like historical biopics, go ahead, be my guest. I mean, if you like Oliver Stone's work, try to see this. But otherwise, I just... I don't even know why I bought it. I bought it at my local thrift store for five bucks. It's just like... Pfft. It's like, Colin Farrell, Angel Angel Lee? Yeah, sure, why not? From Alexander, we go to a more contemporary setting. We go to high school. Really? We're starting here now? Okay. Since Matt doesn't know what you're talking about, I'll assume you mean the high school, the hive of the popular and the mean and the girly. Oh no. And, the, and the, those no. who wear pink on Wednesdays. Oh no. Oh yes. Yes. Oh no. We're gonna talk about Clueless. Wait, what? Wait, no, not what? Gonna talk about that was a joke, you guys. I know though. I got it, got it. It was really good. <laughs> yeah, he gets it. I'm just like, <laughs> He is. He's just like, what? Clueless. Anybody remember Clueless? No? Okay, moving on. We're gonna talk about Mean Girls. Oh, oh, okay. I was thinking you were about to talk about High School Musical. That came out in 2005, I believe, so... High School okay. Musical? You... I say oh. the word mean and girly, and you go to High School Musical. Mike said high school. I... It takes place oh. in high school. And everybody is all... everybody in High School Musical acts girly. Oh, and mean as well. Well, it's mean to its audience. Hey, Wednesdays. Matt, you failed. <laughs> it's been a while. Hey, it's been a long time since I've seen. Movies, I been, okay, it's, it's it's been a long time since I've seen Mean Girls. Admittedly. You even watch those Madeline Kahn movies I told you to see? Like any of them? All right. Uh, I'm getting there. I'm getting there. Sky. Sky. Uh, I'm getting there. He's got more subscribers than all of us. <laughs> Can't get a bloody Mean Girls reference. He's more successful on the internet than we are. Hey, to be fair, it's because of animated stuff, not Lindsay Lohan movies. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Anyways. Go on with, with the with Mean Girls. Movie directed by Tina Fey, starring Jennifer Aniston, as well as Rachel McAdams, and some other people. It is a sort of is a comedy movie with a sort of kind of social commentary about the ever growing, ever not growing. Hold on, I need to think of a smart way to introduce this, you guys. Mean Girls. It's a movie about high school and the ladder of success and popularity. And mean Girls. The only. Mean Girls, the only Lindsay Lohan movie worth remembering. There you go. You don't like Parent Trap? Oh, yeah. Oh, no. Oh, no, wait. Freaky Friday. Well, Freaky Friday was good. One of the three. One of the three. One of the three. Yeah. Parent Trap, Freaky Friday, and Mean Girls. It's regarded today as one of the... One of the most memetic comedies. For, for some people, one of the best, and one of the most... Girl friendly, you know, up there with like Legally Blonde, and and she's the man, Pitch Perfect, I guess. It's like it's, it's a comedy for girls. It's so really fetch, all right? Really able to be appreciated by guys. Movie for girls because it's about more than just girls. It's about teenagers, you know, and also it's 
really fucking funny. It's one of my favorite comedies. I may not like it as much as Legally Blonde because it doesn't say important things in the way that Legally Blonde does, but I like it because for, for what it's saying, it's saying it in a really entertaining way, you know? Like, I like a lot of the characters. I, I feel like even though they're exaggerations, they're also kind of realistic, you know? Like, not realistic, but I can see the kind of people that those characters are based on. And I can see it very clearly. You know what I mean? When, when I hear the mean girls talking to Jennifer Aniston, not Jennifer, <laughs> Lindsay Lohan, I don't know why I said Jennifer Aniston. They're talking to Lindsay Lohan, and, and they're, they're saying the, like, catty, fake, nice things. I, I can sort of... I remember the way other people talked in high school to girls when they were being, like, really catty and very insincere, you know? And I, I, I remember characters like Janice, and I remember teachers that, like, go to school and try to talk to students in a relatable way, like Tina Fey, you know? And, and I remember mm -hmm. the way students would treat other students and how some students would feel left out and, and uh, disconnected from everybody and like eating lunch in bathroom stalls. I never ate lunch in bathroom stalls. I'm not talking about me. I'm talking about a friend. An unpopular friend. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah, an unpopular friend, yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, all right, yes. all right, yeah. Anyway. Poor, poor girl. Meaning, meaningfulness of the movie aside, it, it's mostly the fact that it's funny. Yeah, it's a really good comedy. Janice and Damien, and, and even Lindsay Lohan. You know, there's there's a lot of clever humor, and I love clever humor, especially clever humor that still tries to talk to teenagers. You know, because there's so mm -hmm. so there's so little of that. You know, you've either got a clever comedy that's like friggin' hot fuzz trying to talk to like the R-rated crowd, adults, or you've got a teenager movie that's stupid. You know, mm -hmm. I, I like that movies are smart and geared towards teenagers. I appreciate. Mm -hmm. You know, because we're intelligent. They're a rare breed. They're a rare breed. No, I, I definitely what you, I definitely get what you mean about Mean Girls. It definitely is, um, it definitely is a really smart comedy, and it, it is, like, it kind of is relatable not only to girls but also to guys as well. Because like, there are times when guys would have to face these things. Like, you got to fa face like some of these jerks as well. Mm -hmm. Like, it does gear a lot towards the girls. How. Um, mostly trying like um mostly like they're the more suitable roles in this matter mm -hmm. but like de definitely there are a lot of there are, there are definitely a lot a lot of um a lot of great moments and a lot of great performances as well even lizzie lohan was pretty pretty good in there as well although the one i never had a problem with lizzie lohan as an actress you know i, th I think she could have had a decent career if, you know mm -hmm. oh yeah yeah, yeah i agree i agree she just had different Film choices. I don't know. It's, it depends on the film. Drug choices. It, it wasn't because of her film choices that, that she. Yeah, yeah, it was more than that. No. This is a that's a whole different. Story. That's a whole different episode in general. <laughs> Not bring down. Yeah. No, but the one thing I will say, if there is a little bit of a, like I wouldn't say this is a, a criticism. It's it's a little bit of a nitpick that kind of works in uh, kind of a critic criticism, but it's like the way that they represent some of the guys here, like most of them, they're pretty dumb. I'm not gonna lie. The guys are the, the male characters aren't really the important parts of the story. Like you've got. I know, but like, yeah, the but they just they just dumbed us down or something. It's like they're yeah, dumb. No, like, they're really dumbed down. Like I remember like. When some of the girls were fighting, you get this one random guy coming in and like, Yeah! Take your top off! It's like, where the hell do you come from? There was, there was definitely some low-brow humor in there. I, I like the gym teacher. He's one no, of the but like, it kind of works. Guy. No, 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 but it does kind of work at the same time, mostly through the stupidity. Like, it, it does kind of work. The, 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 pr the principle. The principal, okay, the yes. first character who's mm -hmm. witty, and mm -hmm. who's smart, and yep. who's important. Okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yep. But I'm mostly talking about, like, the students, the students and stuff like that. But, like, no, but yeah, like, definitely some of the, like, like actors like the, like, characters like the principal, like, de I, I definitely do know what you mean, yeah. 
pretty hysterical in my opinion. Um, did you know? Did you know it was filmed in Toronto? Was. Mm-hmm. Even though it was set in Illinois, it was uh, filmed in Toronto. You'd be shocked at the amount of movies that get filmed in Toronto. Oh, there's like, a lot. Actually, yeah, in the University of Toronto, actually. It, it's, mean Girls has somewhat of a cult following. I I I think, in my opinion, like this. <laughs> It's, it's, like, it's, it's I, was this successful at the box office? I think so. I yeah. Was Lohan, was like, yeah, it was successful, but I just, it just did, like this year alone, like it was a 10th anniversary event, and people were like, like excited for it. They were tweeting about it, and they were like, I guess it was more like a fan base kind of thing, more than a cult status, mm-hmm. but. Yeah, it's more of a fan. I would consider it a fan base. That's like, what. I, but if it was... it was a hit, then I would say, uh, I would definitely say, yeah, it's. Uh... Which I think it's great because, like, how many girly movies do you know that have like fandoms? You know, it's yeah. mostly this kind of superhero stuff that has nerdy fandoms. But Mean Girls, Mean Girls breaks the mold. And there, there was that one guy. Oh, what was his name? He he. This year he he was on Dancing on Stars in the U.S. For a while before he got eliminated, so a little cult. Meadows. I don't know what the guy's name. I just, but he was on Dance with the Stars for a little bit before getting kicked off. <clears throat> he didn't win. Um, but this this fran- it became a franchise pretty much because then they got a, the direct DVD sequel, Mean Girls Two. Oh, yeah. oh good God, that's a thing. <laughs> I oh, God, I see it. it was. Aired on ABC Family in 2011. Ew! 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 That looks so bad. It looks so stupid. It, it, There's part of you thinking, well, maybe it's not as bad as all that. It is. Yeah. It is. Don't listen to that T- part. It's TV movie, so. Yeah, it is. But here's the thing. This, this is why you're thinking of Jennifer Aniston, because they're making an. A new movie. It's called be, gonna be called Mean Moms. It's a spinoff. I, I, I think I just get Jennifer Aniston and Lindsay Lohan mixed up for some reason. <laughs> I don't know how how, but I just that's that was the it was like she was gonna star in the spinoff called Mean Moms, and it's gonna be coming out sometime next year apparently. Will Amy Poehler be in it? Uh, Amy Poehler is the original cool mom. Oh, she was. She was, and there's there's very little information on it right now, but it just, yeah. And also a stage musical. Really? I could see that. I mean, Legally Blonde was a good musical. Faye confirmed that, that a musical adaptation of Mean Girls is in the works. Of course, Faye was the writer and. Uh, Faye will be the writer and possibly the director of the musical, while 30 Rock composer and Faye's husband, Jeff Richmond, will work on the music. Paramount will be also involved. If Legally Blonde could be a musical, then Mean Girls could be a musical. I see no problem with it. Ah, uh, you might have a point there, actually. Yeah. <laughs> Alright, are let's, we good with Mean Girls? Let's let's just say Mean Girls is one of those comedies that are really funny, and Lindsay Lohan does a, a, a awesome acting job in it. Mm-hmm. Let's go on to a sequel that, yes, came, that yes, came out yes. in 2004, which I have personally seen, and honestly, I have never seen any other sequels beyond two. I good. stayed... I stayed at no. two because two is what is actually my favorite out of the franchise. I think I know what you're talking about. I'm not All right, guys, let's open the books and move on to the early 2000s. Once upon a time, there was an animated feature that was so beloved and actually not made by Disney by the name of Shrek. And like I said, it really was beloved. A belong to the point where it literally became the icon, an icon of animation, much more than Disney and even Pixar. 
And then also got a Broadway musical. Yes, that's true. That's He's true. He's got to Broadway musicals. It's just that kind of day. <laughs> wow, it really helped with that Broadway special. Uh, but anyways, with that, but then suddenly, a sequel came in, known as Shrek 2. And it really boosted the popularity of Shrek. It was crazy. And there really was, there really is a good reason. Shrek 2 is pretty much, um, it goes into like what happened after Happily Ever After. And we like, we meet the parents essentially. Like we meet Fiona's mom and dad where they also have to reveal like Fiona is now like permanently an ogre. But she's happy with it with Shrek and stuff like that. And the way that they really brought in, it's like, what we consider flaws nowadays, they they were pretty much the reasons for them, because they did it right. This movie featured tons and tons of, like, pop culture references, but they actually really do work, and they really are, and, like, a lot of them really are great, especially through, uh, from the design of Far, Far Away, where they made pretty much, like, a modern town, but, like... It's, it's pretty much best described as a, mo a modern town with this medieval theme to it. And it, it really is interesting. And I gotta say, um, even the story itself is actually pretty interesting. Because, like, because not only is the story itself really interesting, but also the fact that um, how it really expands upon the world of Shrek. Like, they even, like they look into like the cur like the o they really go deep deep into the ogre curse uh they go into why fiona was in that uh dungeon and like and like many different others and plus the fact that when they introduce new characters they really are fantastic i mean everyone loves puss in boots and it really um there's really an interesting factoid that i got about um the fairy godmother and uh, Prince Charming, actually, with uh, the fairy, uh, just want to see, like, Prince Charming, he was voiced by Rupert Everett. Um, he was actually cast because he was rejected from when he auditioned for Gaston in Beauty and the Beast. And Jennifer Sauters, who played the fairy godmother, she was rejected, uh, she got in because she was rejected be from an audition uh, to play as Ursula in The Little Mermaid. And they really do work well in here. It really is, really is fantastic. Plus the fact that um, it also goes into more into the, like the fairy tale stuff, like uh, the gin, like we meet like the muffin. We actually meet the Muffin Man. Um, also the fact, uh, what else? I'm trying to think. Well, like we also got the recurring care, the recurring um, uh, fairy tale characters who are really great. And uh, I'm trying to think if there were other... Yeah, there were a few others. Like, they throw in a few fairy tale references here and there, and they really are great. So, overall, <clears throat> Shrek 2, amazing comedy, was one, was at one point the highest-grossing animated feature before Toy Story 3. And, um, yeah, it really... Like, they, like DreamWorks like, really did peak with uh, Shrek 2. It was fantastic. Well, I don't know about peak. That implies that they didn't make excellent, if not better, movies afterwards, which they did. I, well, I don't mean peak, you know? but like they really like. Uh, well, I don't necessarily mean peak. Like they really skyrocketed from like sh like they really skyrocketed with Shrek Two. I thought uh. Shrek 2 was like to me. Shrek Two was was them foreshadowing the kind of great stuff that they were capable of doing. You know what? Like it was showing How to Train Your Dragon and Rise of the Guardians. It took them a few years. It took them a Madagascar movie. That would take a while. Yeah. It took them a movie that I'm sure we can all agree has nothing good about it. But we Wait, won't talk again. Oh, that one. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yes. Good. <laughs> the Will well, Smith this, fish, right. Shrek 2 was DreamWorks telling us that, that despite their current still trying to get over their bitterness at Disney, they were capable of doing some really amazing things. Mm. Some really amazing things. Going beyond just comedy and having some really unbelievably brilliant moments in there mm -hmm. you know and i love puss in boots so much you know he is he's like he's like they try to decide what would be the most adorably squee inducing thing in the world antonio banderas 
kittens. An Antonio Banderas kitten. You know, it actually works so well that you can literally give him his own movie and it would actually turn out pretty good. <laughs> well, you know, he was so great in Shrek 2. He was great. <laughs> you didn't like uh, Puss in Boots, did you? Like the movie? I'm did sorry? You see, did, you, did you even see uh, Puss in, like, the Puss in Boots movie? Yes, I saw it. I've seen all the Shrek movies and Shrek-related movies. Huh. Did, you yeah. did you like Puss in Boots? It was not as bad as I thought it was going to be, but it wasn't good enough to, like, make me surprised. Yeah. Mm. No, like, it's definitely not as good as the first two Shrek films, but, like, it's still good. I mean, it's not like the last two Shrek films. You know what? I thought it was better than Shrek 4. I might... I didn't think it was as good as Shrek 3. <laughs> bad moments in it, but it also had some really, really good moments. Like, I love the moment where, where Snow White... Like a scene with the little... Uh, Shrek 3, it's a fact that Shrek 3 killed the franchise. It's Shrek 3 is not that bad. Shrek 3... No, 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 no. I'm not mentioning... It's not rather the fact if it's good or bad. Because th what I mean is that I remember distinctively during that time. Remember what I mentioned when Shrek was the biggest thing? It was an icon of animation mm -hmm. and stuff like that? Mm -hmm. After the release of Shrek 3, it went silent. Nobody talked about Shrek ever since. Like it I was. Don't think that's true. People no. talk. People mention. No, I it remember. I there. remember distinctively. I I was there too, and like they, I remember at the Oscars. It was which was it? 2010. It was the year Anne Hathaway hosted, and it was terrible. But they talked about Shrek as being the movie that started the. Oh, they only. I think, I think I remember which one you mean. Is it the one where they point us like, Oh, look, you're wearing Far, Far Away. Yeah, it's great. Here are the nominees. I don't know what you're, that's supposed to mean. I just know they, they pay tribute the to Oscars. it. They talked about it. I, I know you're talking about the Oscars, but I'm not going to clarify whether or not this incident was like that because the inc I don't remember it being like that, but maybe you do because you're a funny daddy. No, well, I remember at one point it was like that. There was a moment. <laughs> People still appreciate Shrek. People no, no, no. also, you know, hate we, on Shrek. We definitely appreciate back. the first two Shrek. Yeah, the first two, yeah, like, especially because I grew up I on that. Think, like, maybe they haven't, like, maybe it didn't go completely silent, but I definitely have seen a total downhill for Shrek after Shrek the third. Like, I remember. Was anybody asking for that romance between the dragon and donkey? I it's, it's, it, it happened ever since. Like that, that was a thing that always happened. First, so. Like, 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 did we, did we want to see the, the, the mutant babies? Like it, like they, they like they implied that. The, wait, which wait? Did they appear in the second or the third one? It was they the post credit scene in this film. Oh yeah. yeah it was. I thought it was a cute. It was, yeah. yeah, it was a cute. It, it uh, but, was like a cute, cute but, joke. But, but, but how? I or they themselves were that bad in the third movie. No, don't think yeah. about it. Don't think about it, Mike. The third movie obviously wasn't that good, but the, the, it, was, it wasn't like the donkey dragon babies were one of the worst parts of it or anything. No, I'm just saying something goofy and weird. No, I don't think about that. Thinking, thinking into it way too much. I mean, Shark 2 is like the one I oh. used, I, I watched way too much as a kid. Well, I was 14 at the time, so I as Shrek, a teenager. I, I saw like Shrek 2 like three times when it was in the theaters. I saw Shrek a couple of times, like, not in the theaters, but at home on DVD, and I thought it was an okay movie, and then I saw Shrek 2 in the theaters, and I loved it, mm. and ever since then I've been a fan of the Shrek franchise. I saw the third one in theaters, which I was disappointed by, but I didn't hate, I did not see the fourth one in theaters, because, fuck that. Yeah, I don't know, for me, like, the fourth one was, I, I find the fourth one a bit better than Shrek the third, but, like, not that much. It wasn't, it was, not sick. It was so unimportant. Like, nothing was yeah. a conflict. It was, it was, it felt like it had the conflicts of a television episode. Like, where, where are we at, we be, at the beginning? Shrek is ha living his happy life and not appreciating it. Where are we at yeah. the end? He's living the same happy life and appreciating it. That's all okay. that happened. But there's one thing that I want to clarify. Ever since, like, people try to answer this in my review, but they, nobody seems to understand what I was saying. In Shrek Forever a After, like, what happened to Lord Farquaad? Because think about it. 
Shrek, Shrek Forever After was supposed to be like it, this It's a Wonderful Life type of movie where Shrek never existed. But if Shrek never existed, where is Lord Farquaad in all of this? Well, if Shrek never existed, then presumably Lord Farquaad would have gotten one of his knights to try and go rescue Fiona, and like all the other knights, he would have failed. Yeah, like... And like, maybe there would have been that one knight who did, like, succeed. Never... No, 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 no! No, it would be Prince Charming! It would be Prince Charming! Uh, yep, like, there would be, yep. It would be, like, this huge battle between Prince Charming, like, with Fiona, and then, like, Lord Farquaad. But if you think about it, the idea is that Prince Charming got to the tower well after the first movie took place. So, it's presumable that during the time of the first movie, in between when Lord Farquaad tried and failed to get Fiona, and when Prince Charming went to find her, she escaped on her own. Or, you know, the fact that Prince Charming Maybe. in the first place had everything to do with the fact that the dragon wasn't there anymore. So if the dragon was there, maybe Charming would have just gotten eaten. Would've you never know. You never know, like, it's one of those difficult <laughs> one-if scenarios. No, but honestly, I'm glad we're having this conversation because, like, when I asked that in my review, everybody kept saying, it was like, well, Lord Farquaad is not there because he was eaten by the dragon. He was eaten by the dragon. He was eaten by the dragon. It's like, but this is a world where Shrek never existed. He wouldn't have been eaten by the dragon. He probably would have just spent his time in his little perfect place, whatever, and nobody would have given a shit about him. Mm -hmm. Maybe he should. The only reason anybody gave a shit about him was that he, because he interfered in Shrek's swamp, which, again, wouldn't have been a problem if Shrek didn't have a swamp because he didn't exist. Maybe, yeah. like, maybe Farquaad would have been, like, maybe he would have gotten, like, another, another girl, maybe, like, Rapunzel. Do they reference the fact that all the fairy tale creatures get, like, imprisoned and exiled by Lord Farquaad? Like, no, they, like, they never mentioned Lord Farquaad at nothing. all. So That's then what the would, thing. I'm trying to remember what, what happened to Donkey and Shrek forever after. Like, he was, he was still, like, a, sl like, a slave donkey, you know? He would have gotten exiled to the swamp. Or what have you. Yeah, like... Yeah, that's the thing. Well, you know what? It's not a very good movie. Yeah. So... <laughs> they did not even put a lot of effort into their shitty premise. We have a conclusion. Screw that movie. Yep, screw that movie. Screw that movie, I say. Screw that movie, and... Yay for Shrek 2. But luckily, Shrek is getting back... Hold on, let me repeat that. Shrek is getting his popularity back thanks to a really creepy and messed up <laughs> internet meme. <laughs> yes. yes. Things work. And honestly, I really wouldn't be surprised if Jeffrey Katzenberg is finding a way to try to market that thing. <laughs> if he's gonna get the license for it, he's gonna make t-shirts out of it. They're, they're making some attempts to try and make a Shrek 5, but I doubt it's gonna happen. Oh god, have you seen, like, the YouTube video, the recent YouTube videos of Shrek? Like, DreamWorks is making these small YouTube videos featuring, like, Shrek or Puss in Boots and Poe. They are horrible. They are a waste of time. And I'm not saying, like, the quality of the animation or anything. They talk about nonsense. Unfunny, stupid nonsense. They're literally a waste of time. They're horribly acted by people who are who weren't even trying to impersonate like the characters. They're just so stupid. Ah uh, man, yeah. Shark Two, same year as Shark Tale. And some, like, and it's very clear and very understandable how that got an Oscar nomination. Shark Tale, I have no idea what they were thinking. Maybe the Academy was like, <laughs> what if Oscar the Shark Tale got nominated for an Oscar? <laughs> Should've gone to Spongebob, just saying. Yeah. More oh. oh wait, hold on a sec, I just want a sec. I um, I just want to check something. You want to check what something? What other, wait a minute, what other, what other films could have been nominated? Didn't we well, House Movie. House Movie. House Movie. We did that last time, but... Yeah, Ghost in a Shell could have been nominated. Ghost in a Shell 2, Innocence, could, could have been nominated. That was a good one. Polar Express would have been... Yeah, uh, maybe. Well, but we'll get into that more. And it was a different kind of animated movie that started with Trent. So, mm -hmm. it could have been mm -hmm. breaking. It's only mm -hmm. But... But... 
But when it comes to a animated movie, my next film has a little something different when it comes to it. Um, what if you built a movie where you have everything, like the backgrounds, the sets, the props, everything being CGI, and having live actors act in front of a blue screen? Think of it like Sin City did in 2005. I'm talking about Sky Captain and the World Tomorrow. This film is basically all. Is, sh is that the steampunk movie? Yes, it's 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 actually Diesel. <laughs> it's it's Diesel Punk technically, but yes, it's all it's a movie set in alternate uh, reality where it's like World War Two and post blah 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 kind of thing. You know, Nazis and all that shit. <laughs> um, basically, this one man created a short using his Mac, you know, doing all these special effects, you know, on the blue screen with the, the unknown actors. Took it to a studio, and they're like, oh my gosh, let's make a movie out of that. And it's all shot in blue screen, like, I, I kid you not, most of the film is all special effects except for the live actors in it. It's, it's, it's kind of what started it all, because Sin City came out a year after, and then you got, was it Immortals, came out in 2004, so, what happens in Sky Captain the World Tomorrow, it's, it's set in 1939, 1940, and, Go, uh, Guelph Paltrow plays Polly Perkins, She's a reporter. She's got this new story and it's all juicy as can be. Robots all of a sudden come out of nowhere. Robots come in, they start attacking the city, and it's like, where are these robots come from? Then you come uh, Julod playing Sky Captain. He sh he's a airplane pilot, he's shooting everything down, and he's all badass and shit. Then... Uh, his real name is actually Joseph Sullivan, which would have been nice to tell James that, but... Yeah. Joseph, yeah, Joseph, been... Joseph Sullivan, Sky Captain. Damn it, James, where are you? <laughs> James, where are you? We're looking for you. Sky Captain of the World Tomorrow is this big mystery film, because, of course, it's set... Black and white. It's kind of like black and whitish. It's it's a homage to all the 30s and 40s, you know, serial kind of uh, epics back in the day. And you can tell it's shot in front of a blue screen because there's a lot of CGI, like a, a lot of CGI, like 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 a lot, so much more than animated film. Like it it's staggering. Like I was looking at it and it's like. Dude, can we get some live action live action stuff here? Like, uh, something happens towards the end where a guy dies, and you see a bone skeleton, and it's all CGI. They couldn't get a real skeleton prop to come in. I really do not want to spoil the the ending, cause goddamn, the build up to this damn movie is just unbelievable. Like, it's it's up there with uh, fucking Iron Iron Sky. It's, if you don't know what Iron Sky is, it's another Nazi uh, alternate reality movie where it's all about Nazis in space. Well, this one kind of has that vibe where it's, it's like where the robots come from. They gotta go to Nepal, you know, in the mountains. They gotta find this island and shit. Something happens on the island and there's, there's, there's something with the island and there's a, there's. Yeah, to stop this from happening, and it's just this big epic CGI live action fest. And Angelina Jolie once again is in this film. Is that your theme? Angelina Jolie, it was the theme. Like, she was in two films in 2004. I thought your theme was movies that I haven't seen. That. Because you love to piss me off. You want to be silenced. I will not be silenced tonight. <laughs> I 
because I want you to actually go out and actually watch it. Because Sky Captain and The World Tomorrow is actually a pretty interesting film. Like, if you're on Channel Awesome, you may know a guy named Era the Blockbuster Buster. And he actually reviewed it a long fucking time ago. And I was watching, I was like, dude, you're hating it on too much because it's a guilty pleasure. It's like, so what if it's shot in front of a blue screen? It's, it's like, okay, sure. It, it's like Phantom Menace, I guess. It's yeah, like, but let's be honest. What film is it nowadays? I mean, uh, uh. Have, like, they're partially sets and partially green screens. Yeah. It's, but see, that's, that's what the style, this is like a trend that started because, you know, you got Sin City and then, you know, guess what? Ten years later, you got Sin City 2. Like, it, it, it just, it's, with. Buster Buster relies on negativity because that's part of his shtick and he does it well, but you know. It's like, just like he, not even honestly. He does something. He pays tribute to like do good things to everybody. It's not often that he talks about. It's not often that he shares an unpopular opinion. Exactly. Um, I just I I was surprised he actually reviewed. It. I was like, whoa, 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 because I was looking for reviews and I was like, what the fuck? He actually reviewed it, but it's not it's not as bad as he points out in the review. If you actually look it up somehow, I don't know if you want to check it out or not, but. It's like if you like, you know, Nazi, like, exploitation kind of, it, even though there's not really Nazis in the film, like, it kind of has something related to it. It's just, it's, it's just a fucked up concept. It's like, I guess, mm-hmm. I guess your ticket is that it, you got ray guns, you got robots, and you got a, a, a goofy island where these unique creatures on it, and of course... Yes, I kind of I'll, I'll slip a little spoil in for you. Just a little tease where the the bad guy's whole plot in the film is basically he has a rocket. Take over the world. He's got a ro- he's got a rocket. He's filling all these animals on it. Of course. Like Noah's Ark, and he wants to destroy the fucking Earth. It's like really like planet Earth does not deserve to live anymore. We. We, it's like environmental kind of thing. It's like we fucked it up. We should just get it, get out of here while we still can. And it's all, it's like, oh. I watched a lot of crazy stuff, and and people don't know what I endure during it. Like, like I snap. Like it's it's just madness. Like I should just be watching stuff I used to watch as a kid. But I'm like, okay, let's push the boundaries on what I should watch and Sky Captain in the World Tomorrow is a guilty pleasure movie that nobody truly appreciates you know uh, one thing I gotta say about while you were talking I was just look I was just looking without the audio of the uh, trailer and I gotta say holy crap this is one this is like ridiculously stylized hmm. like Every single like every single scene that is trying to go like like I I can understand what what is trying to be like it, it's really trying to emulate uh, like the 1920s or 1930s comics or like the look of it and even the style of the robots um, they remind me a lot of the Max Fletcher Superman cartoons in a sense I think that's what the, the little inspiration came from actually mm-hmm. when doing the yeah. films yeah and like. Like, just the movie, like, the entire theme and, like, what it's trying to be, like, it really reminds me kind of, like, if you mix uh, The Rocketeer with Dick Tracy, actually. It really is kind of interesting. That is, yeah. Like, it, it, like I don't know about the story, like, in terms of the story and how it's, like, how it was executed and stuff like that, that I would have to check out for myself. But yes. But other than that, like, it really is intriguing of what it's trying to execute in terms of its looks. Yeah, like, if you research about it, it's like, it's an interesting production history. It's got a, you know, it's a director's debut, but after this film, he does exactly nothing afterwards, so he just falls off, say, face of the earth. But, I forgot to mention, Angelina Jolie's part in this. <laughs> oh, 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 boy. And this, and mind you, this was way before a certain film came out, and, it, and they, this film took inspiration from a previous film. So, uh... Angelina Jolie plays Frankie. She's this um, leader, uh, captain of this British fleet who helps um, 
Sky Captain and Polly in their adventure in this film. They go to their base, which is a hella pad, which looks like a shield's hella pad. Uh, then you see her walk out. She's got an eye patch on. She's freaking. So what you're saying? Spit it out, boy. Spit it out. Kinky? Commissioner Gordon. She's 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 a female Nick Fury. Oh. They took inspiration from the 1998 uh, Shield movie with David Hasselhoff as Nick Fury. Are you and... sure? Yes, because this is way before the Avengers happened. Yeah, but the comics were still around. They probably, I think I was reading IMDb. They said they sourced it from the TV movie with David Hasselhoff, but I was just like, whoa, whoa! It's just like, wait a minute here. This is like beyond Thunderdome shit here, like. We want to take something from this. Yes, we, we, want, we want to remind people of this movie. You know? we, exactly. We want, we want this tone for ourselves. We, we want, you know, this character to be like Nick Fury with an eye patch and very... And she's not even in this movie for very long. She's like in this, like, less than ten minutes in this film, which she gets top billing, by the way. It's just like... Only two people... It's only two people in here. There's only Jula and Gwel, Gwel Paltrow in this, and that's basically it. It's just like I'm. I'm thinking like Nick Fury, Shield, Eye Patch. Uh, fuck. Could have been worse. They could have named her Nikki. Well, Frankie. Frankie is kind of close. Flurry. I was like, okay, but it, it, it it's it's not as bad as a lot of. It, it's, a, it's a guilty pleasure, in my opinion. I, I'll probably get the Blu-ray or DVD of it whenever I find the chance to buy it. If it's even there in the first place. Well, if it's on Netflix, it has to be on DVD somewhere. Now, here comes the fun part. We talk about a film that inspired all of us as kids. Uh, one that has a particular history with all of us. Spongebob. The movie. Yay. The answer to everyone's favorite question, who lives in that pineapple under the deep blue sea? Uh, I was about to say Patrick. Uh, you know, Spongebob Squarepants is People say that they'll preserve the title of one of the most famous Nicktoons of all time. I, I think it does. Because it got that title for, for being what it was before the movie. You know, you can talk about how awful it is now, and, and you wouldn't be wrong, but what, for what it was, it deserves to be this animation legend. I loved that show so much when I was a kid. It was one of my favorites. It's still one of my favorites. And so when the movie came out, I was eight years old by the time. Sorry to make you guys feel old, but I was eight years old when the movie came out, and I wanted to watch it more than anything in the world in theaters. But the thing is, it everybody wanted to watch one of them the theaters. Like, it was insane. It was like freaking... All the theaters were being sold out. I remember when I was standing in, like, this huge-ass line that extended through the entire mall. Like, we stood in a line for almost three hours before a guy came out and said that Spongebob Squarepants was sold out, and I was, like, crying in the hallway, sitting on this random couch that was on display, and my parents were trying to console me. A, a few weeks later, we tried to see it again. It got sold out again. Not a few weeks, a few days. And I think that was the day that my dad said, you know what, let's just go see The Incredibles instead. And I was like, okay. So we saw The Incredibles instead, and I loved it. But I have to admit, a few days later, when I finally got the chance to go and see Spongebob Squarepants in theaters, I was a little happier. Because I finally got the movie that my television fan self wanted. And it was everything I hoped it would be. It was, you know what? Nickelodeon is good at making movies based off their show. They are. They, the Rugrats movie, two, mm. two of them, 
Yeah, yeah I really do like uh, Rugrats in Paris, actually. The, the, the Jimmy Neutron movie, that was good. Uh, that actually started out as its own thing. The, the, mo- the show came out after. Yeah, the show came after the movie. Jimmy Neutron? Yep. Yeah. Are you? Sure? Yep. Yeah. Yep, I was there. I had the soundtrack. I was a Jimmy Neutron fan. I was like... Yep, I recall. Uh, yep, huh. it spun off. Yeah, it was that popular. It spun up to a TV series. You know what? It was already on tape by the time I got t- into the show, so I guess that's possible. That just never occurred to me that it was a movie before it was a show. But that's interesting. That's good. That's an interesting factoid there, Mike. You're welcome. But SpongeBob, I mean, it was funny. It, it had it had a higher end of animation. It, it was epic. It had awesome moments and awesome songs. It, it made me cry a couple times. Like that one scene where SpongeBob and Patrick, they almost died, mm-hmm. and they realized oh, that yeah. they finally got the crown after all, and they were like, we, we, we did all right for a couple of goofballs. Oh, and then yes. there's the, yeah. the tear. Here's a right. little heart shaped tear. And then it was just. Oh my god, that was sad. So hard. Oh, oh God! Everything the the pl- plankton and Squidward and Mr. Krabs and everybody was in it. And oh my God! I'm sorry. This isn't even really an analysis. This is just me tr- devolving into my eight-year-old self again. God, the, the the movie was was like the one thing the the, the final bow out for, for what SpongeBob used to be until the show took its Steven Hillenburg less run and started just going slowly. Deadly. So that's what happened. Okay, makes sense. Yeah, the creator Steven Hillenburg, who originated the show and who made the movie, directed it, wrote it, and all the works, he left the show because the movie was supposed to be the finale. Hence what? Oh. Hence the finale. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was supposed to end at the Especially movie. Manager, which, of course, if none of that is mentioned again in the show, by the way. Nope. We never get back to the question crap, too. Yeah. Like, just running the jump like the same as always. Because yeah. they were like, screw that, SpongeBob's too popular to keep going. So they yeah. kept the Steven Holmberg was like, no, fuck that, and he left. And the result. Yeah, I, but I, I did actually heard he is coming back. I don't know. You know, I want to be happy, but I'm just not sure that he can save it anymore. Mm. Honestly, I, I think true. it's gone. And true. Heck, Buffy, Buffy went to shit even when Joss Whedon reluctantly stayed with it after he wanted to cancel. His involvement did no good. Yeah, pretty much. Wait, Josh Whedon was working on SpongeBob? No, Buffy. I was comparing. Oh, he, he was compare. She oh, was doing okay. a comparison. Oh, I know. Right, right. I I was no. I was no, like. I was like. Did you catch that? It was Buffy. Okay. See, Buffy, see, Buffy was a show that on season five, Josh Whedon wanted to cancel, but then the cast said no, so he kept it going, and the result was less enthusiasm. Let's just say that. All right. All right. And the same thing happened with Spongebob, only instead of less enthusiasm, it's no enthusiasm. Yeah, I'm definitely with you on that. Like, the, the same story with me. I love, love Spongebob as a kid. I was a huge fan. I always watched the show. I, I remember I have great fond memories. I have some favorite episodes. It wasn't until, I think, after season five, season five or middle of season four, or like, maybe around season, season five or something. started to go bad. Like, there were, there were some good yeah. episodes. Like, I think it was somewhere in season five, I pretty much gave up on Spongebob. It was no longer, like, I felt like it was no longer good, and the jokes were pretty much juvenile. It's not like I was growing old, it was just the show was getting sucky. And, um, no, but I definitely agree that the Spongebob movie really was awesome. It had great, you know, like, even great songs, great performances, great action, mm-hmm. and, um... Do you remember how insane it was when it came out in theaters? Like, how many kids were yeah. dragging their kids? Yeah. Like, oh, yeah. That's how it was enough. Like, theaters getting sold out left and right. Was, was it like that in America, too? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was going to tell you my experience, because I went to see it on the mega screen. My God, that theater was packed, and all my friends at school were going to see it, and they were just, like, all excited, and it was all sold out. I was like, holy shit, this movie's going to be big. It was like... Oh, yeah, it is. It, it, it's more like... around it than The Incredibles, which is a Disney Pixar movie. Exactly. It was like, it was the biggest so, thing. Yeah, and, and here's the thing with the SpongeBob movie is that this is the perfect ex- example of how to take um, a TV show and make it, like, grow as extensively big for the movie because this is literally, like, Plankton has taken over Bikini Bottom 
the Krusty Krab has gone like the Chum Bucket is actually getting more popular than uh, the Krusty Krab and all that stuff. Like moments you would never expect to happen in the SpongeBob movie is happening. I remember when I, when Plankton finally got the secret formula. I was just like, <gasps> yes, he got the secret formula, and that's the thing. He's making Krabby Patties. Oh my god. Yeah. Although there is one, as a SpongeBob fan, I do kind of have one criticism, and that is King Neptune, honestly. Like, why did they have to change his design entirely? Yeah, if you. In the TV show, he has this more like, I I don't know how to put it, like a realistic tone, and he was voiced by John O'Hurley. Here, he has the more cartoony SpongeBob look, voiced by um, Jeffrey Tambor. Mm-hmm. Like, he's good, but like, why the change? Honestly? Yeah, I noticed like, that too. That I was like, really cool if we had that original King Neptune, mm-hmm. and then we have like Mindy on the side, you know? Mm-hmm. Like they I... really, they really could have greatly benefited from that. Like they introduced, like Mindy would be like, would have she would have been like the Kimmy, like in Rugrats, like for SpongeBob. Like she could have been like she came in from the movie and then she'll be like spawning into the. To the show, you know. Mm. Your, your Kimmy comparison is a little interesting since I wasn't fond of Kimmy, but that's all right. Uh, I, I think they just changed it because it was a different animation style, you know, and also because they wanted to do the ball thing and the Neptune. My effect. eyes, my yeah. eyes, <laughs> my eyes. <laughs> yes. They, they didn't change him as much as they changed him in Atlantis Square Pantus. So there's that. You remember that? I don't think I, I think like yeah I think I gave up before and like this is pants. largely considered to be the worst episode of Spongebob ever made and seriously you, hold on if you saw Atlantis Squarepants you would not complain about any changes made to King Neptune or Atlantis in the Spongebob Squarepants movie I'm telling you that right now no but I remember much later um oh my god yeah like I remember much later they did bring back the original um King, uh, they brought back the original King Neptune. Like, um, I heard like some a, an episode in 2010. They brought back the original King Neptune with John O'Hurley and stuff. Yeah, I think there was an episode where he came back and it was like he had a son that, that mm-hmm. was acting out or something like that. They didn't reference Mindy. Yeah. Because they, they never reference the movie anymore. That's yeah, that's the thing I hate. Like, I love it when movies, like the Rugrats movie or the Pokemon movies, do reference um, the movie in their TV shows, because, like, like it would really feel like it's in canon. the Rugrats movies made, had impacts on the show. Like, after the Rugrats movie came out, they had Dill. After Rugrats in Paris, Chucky had a mom. And, and yeah, and Kimmy. That, they referenced it all the time. They referenced going to Paris. They, they referenced the Reptar toy. They don't do any of that shit with Spongebob. Yeah, yeah. I hate it. Like I hate it when like shows have a movie and they don't reference it at all. Like they also did the same thing with Yu-Gi-Oh the movie, where like Yugi would have to go and face like he he had to face one of his biggest challenges when he had to fight against Anubis, the god of the dead, and like and like this like it was in canon with the show because this was set after season four when. Yu-Gi-Oh was the when Yugi was the Battle City champion and he defeated Merrick, and then like afterwards they just never mentioned it again. And it was a big thing. Like they they brought in Maximilian Pegasus. They they like it was a big battle between Kaiba and Yugi and all that stuff. And they never mentioned this again in the sh- like afterwards in the show. Like I just don't get it. <laughs> Sorry, I think I went on my Yu-Gi-Oh fanboy tangent. Yeah, you did. There is one of the things I want to talk about, and that's. When I said earlier that Spongebob, that Nickelodeon is really good at making movies based off of their cartoons, what what I should have said is that they were really great at making movies based off their cartoons. Because nowadays, I mean, they have their live-action Fairly Odd Parents movies, three of them. Yeah, you can't can't say that that with them. That's make sequels. Like, why? (laughs) You can't say that about um, Drake Bell. (laughs) No. <laughs> and hold on, I can bring in my it, friend Joey Tedesco and let's see what he'll say about him. <laughs> God, yeah. Oh. And, and there, as some of 
you may know, because it's been a, going around for a while now, there was recently some news that SpongeBob would be getting yet another movie called SpongeBob Fish Out of Water. And oh, that SpongeBob movie would be... Sponge, sponge Out of Water. Sponge yeah, out of water. Sponge Out of Water, yes, because he's a sponge, yep. not a fish. Yep. <laughs> he is a sponge, you see. I, I... None of the main characters are fish, now that I think about it. Well, except maybe Mrs. Puff. But all the main characters Mrs. Puff are, like, is much sea okay. animals. Oh. Actually, yeah. I was about to say Pearl, but... Yeah, it's a mammal. She's a whale. Whales are not fish. They are whales. Yeah. The point is, no, they're daughters. Whales are daughters of crabs. Okay? Yeah, yeah. The, the the new movie, the yeah, the new one coming out next year was it would have been nice. If it came out this year. It would have been a tenth anniversary. Actually, it would have been cool. But next uh, year, that would yeah, been but great. Uh, the premise of the movie is that I, there's some shit that happens when SpongeBob and his crew need to go out of the ocean, and when they go out of the ocean, they become people in suits, in SpongeBob suits, and everything is live action. It's, like with fairly odd parents. It's CGI, I believe. Yeah, it's like it's it's like mix of CGI I and in live uh, action. action. Yes. Yeah, like fairly odd. Because the fairies. The fairies were CGI. Yeah, 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 yeah. I see what you meant. Yeah. Alfred and the Chipmunks and the Smurfs and so many. I mean, why? I don't know why they couldn't do the same thing with what they did in the past. It's like, they could have done the... But no, CGI had to be the thing. I'm, I'm hoping that maybe the cartoon movies will come back, because Peabody and Sherman was really, really good, and I wasn't expecting it to be. I was expecting it yeah. to be like, hey, after the reviews, but no, it's actually a fantastic movie. And Peanuts looks really good, and Popeye looks really mm. good, so maybe... maybe <laughs> go on. No, 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 go on. doesn't yeah. do well. Because Lord knows, Fairly Odd Parents is bombing is one thing, but this is Spongebob, this is Nickelodeon's Golden Goose, and yes. if there could be bombs, well, Peanuts makes money, then maybe that'll cause Hollywood to change their minds. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe. No, definitely, definitely. Actually, I am pretty intrigued with, uh, I actually do have, um, I actually am pretty excited for the upcoming Spongebob movie, because it, it, it does seem a little bit different than mm -hmm. like the other movies you mentioned like Smurfs or Alvin and, and the Chipmunks and Daniel stuff like that. Like, like, is in the film. Even when they even when they come out of the water, they still have like the animation is still like SpongeBob esque even if they can't even if it's like CGI. Like it's still yeah. very reminiscent of SpongeBob. But it's still the same writers that have been writing SpongeBob for the past few shitty years. You know? I don't know. We'll we'll just have to wait and see. Yeah. Like, I'm not saying it's gonna be like it's a it's like it's for sure gonna be awesome, but like I, I am pretty ecstatic to see how it is. Like I'm I'm ready to come back to the world of Spon to the world of Bikini Bottom, you know. Yeah, I won't be waiting three hours in line at the mall for it this time. I can tell you that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, SpongeBob isn't what it used to be. Trust me. See, when it comes to SpongeBob. <sighs> My childhood was completely surrounded in SpongeBob. I mean, in elementary school, my sixth grade class was called the SpongeBobs. The whole class, because we, in the yearbook, we can, can name the class, and we were called the SpongeBobs because we, the whole class was insane about SpongeBob. And even, of course, this was in elementary school back in 2001, 2002. I get a VHS tape with highlights, and the opening thing, opening song. Is a SpongeBob SquarePants theme song. We're that obsessed with SpongeBob back in elementary school. So I was obsessed obsessed with the SpongeBob movie. And of course, David Hasselhoff was a great cameo. Yes! <laughs> David Hasselhoff. I had no idea who that was when I was a kid. My, yeah. I was just like, this is just some guy and my mom and my mom was laughing. Or was it my dad? Somebody was laughing. Now I know who David Hasselhoff is, and it's pretty awesome. It's like and I well. and they made I, they made a oversized replica of them too for the film. <laughs> yeah, I actually not too long ago I actually saw um, I think I saw I I saw it go on sale and they were offering like twenty thousand dollars twenty thousand dollars for it for like this fourteen fourteen foot replica of David Hasselhoff. <laughs> exactly. What would you do with some? You know, don't answer that. Yeah, yeah. I don't want to know. Nope. Everybody's got know. their own I thing. I don't know what. 
I don't want to know. They probably put on display, maybe. You know. Press X with it. <laughs> hey, hey, this babe. is my booty. That's a laugh. Hey, babe. You like the SpongeBob movie? <laughs> I got the Hasselhoff that SpongeBob fought that the the bounty hunter with. <laughs> Like I said, I had the soundtrack to it as well. Like, I, I listened... Gooby Goober Rock was actually one of my favorite songs from the film. Yes. Gooby Goober! Yeah, and that's another th- That's another thing. That the the soundtrack is actually pretty awesome. It is. It, it's a stellar soundtrack. I had it on CD. I listened to it on my CD player at school. I was like, oh, yeah! That's some really dark moments in it, too, for a kid's movie. Like, there were some moments that freaked me out. Like, the thing with the late, the ice cream truck lady that was secretly yes. a giant monster. Oh. <laughs> I'm that, that, that was some Gravity Falls type shit right there. Yeah. That was messed up. <laughs> uh, SpongeBob, how we love you. Oh, how we love you, SpongeBob. Oh, uh, whatever happened to you anyways. You know, oh yeah, funny story, actually. I, I, um... I actually did came back. I actually did go like a long time ago. I think it was in 2004. Um, I actually went to see a live SpongeBob show. Now, what it is is actually, it's not really what you think. It's um, I went to see. It's pretty much all the actors who did the voices of SpongeBob, like Tom Kenny, Mr. Lawrence, okay. and those mean, people. Yeah. Like they went to go and like they did like a live reading of an episode and. What? Was Clancy Brown there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think no. Um, no. What? If, I, if I recall, like. Well, screw that. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Stop he plays no. Mr. Krabs. No, no, I re- recall. Like, no, it was um. Okay, there was Tom Kenny. There was Roger Bumpass. There was Bill Fagerbake. There was Mr. Lawrence, and there was Carolyn Carolyn Lawrence. And the funny thing is, it was Bill who who did, like, the... He was the substitute for Mr. Krabs. He actually does a really good Mr. Krabs. But he does... But did he also do Shawshank Redemption and Highlander, Matt? <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah but, like, like, it's a good replacement. <laughs> Kurgan. But anyway, no, but it really was awesome. It really is great. They were the really nice people. It was... It was a, it, I really had a blast when I saw that. And they did a live reading. It, like they pretty much did the whole episode live of um, the prank episode, the April Fools one. April oh, Fools. Yeah, that one. I, I know that April one. Fools. <laughs> yeah, we uh, love it so much. Our fandoms go cuckoo in the head. Yep. Now, the coup de gras for Mr. Matthew. Yes. Uh, the, 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 the film that brought Robert Zemeckis into a whole new world when it comes to animation. <laughs> motion capture. With the polar... Oh, it's not just, oh, but it's not just motion capture. You are in the Polar Express. Yes, in 2000, yes, at the end of 2004, we saw a new holiday classic, which is The Polar Express, which is pretty much the story of a little boy who goes on a magical train that goes up to the North Pole where they meet Santa Claus. And this utilizes a uh, motion cap. This is, I think this is one of the first uh, animated features that uses motion capture as an animation, as an animation medium, which started this controversy of if motion capture would be considered an animation medium and not like an extra thing for special effects and stuff like that and i gotta say it is yeah it's like yeah it's pretty much the rotoscoping of cgi Mm -hmm. um but like it is like it's pretty good i wouldn't say it's great but it is pretty good like it does have like a cute little heart like the story is really cute it does have this heartwarming tale of a bull like this kind-hearted kid uh going in this magical train but like like we mostly see it in his perspective like it's mostly the magic of the train and like the way they executed really does feel like a children's story especially especially with some of the characters the kid meets from like all the other kids, the conductors especially, like the one with the really long beard, um, 
Uh, there's also like that the weird freaky Tom Hanks hobo, and that's another thing. Tom Hanks plays so many roles in this. Like, apparently he was the narrator, he was the kid's dad, he was the conductor, he was the hobo, he was Scrooge. Apparently, the Scrooge was the puppet played by the hobo. Oh, okay. Well, oh, technically that counts as the Whoa. hobo. That's and, he was, and he was also Santa. And I gotta say, like, and this is this is a movie that's all about the magic of the Polar Express, and it really is, um, you know, like sometimes the Polar Express would act like a huge roller coaster, and like especially many of the performances, like when they, like when they get hot chocolate, it's definitely one of the more memorable scenes, and like. Some of the kids, I will admit, they are they are all right, but except there's one that stands out like a freaking sto- sore thumb. Are you we talking about Mandark? Yes, we got all these kids, and then out of the blue, you got freaking Mandark talking about trains. You know what? When I first saw that, I was like, I know that voice. I don't know that voice. And like it's a couple months later, it hit Mandark. Yeah, Please. it's like. Yeah, it's like, yeah, I don't care if his name is Eddie Deason. That's freaking Mandark. That's Mandark being obsessive over about trains. Yep. And, it, and like, you know, there, are, there is a sense that kid, kids must be mad at, at, at this movie. It's like, what the hell? This is bullcrap. Mandark gets a train to Polar Express and not Dexter? Well, oh, okay, actually, <laughs> Dexter did try to blow up Santa, so... That does make sense. <laughs> I just realized that. It's like, oh yeah, that episode. <laughs> oh my god. But the one controversial thing, I will admit, um, I will say I am not really a huge fan of of this kind of motion capture. Like, uh, like, like I'm not, I'm not op- opposed to motion capture. Like, if you can really do it right, then great. Like, Tintin is the greatest example of using motion capture as an animation medium, no doubt about it. But this, I don't really get it because they're using motion capture to make people. They're making people look like people. Yeah. You know, it's not like in Pirates in the Caribbean where they make them like half fish, half people. They're just making people look like people. Yeah. And it makes no sense. It's like you're making this way too expensive for nothing. You might as well just have actors in a blue screen. You what know what I mean? Eventually, after one of their movies didn't bring their money back, they were like, you know what, maybe this isn't worth it. No, it's Mars Needs Moms, and that bombed so bad. And, like, like that's the thing. Everything. Like, it got worse and worse and worse, because, like, in Mars Needs Moms, they did not look like people. Mm-hmm. And in The Christmas Carol, like, admittedly in The Christmas Carol, like... They look like zombies, but it kind of helps because they're ghosts. So it kind of work. It all works out. <laughs> they're already dead inside. <laughs> to be fair, Jim Carrey is already like fifty percent cartoon. So. Yeah, true. Only so much you can do. Yeah, that that that's true. Yeah. Although I will admit that 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 version of the Christmas Carol is just messed up. Like it was creepy and just messed up beyond belief. There are some messed up parts in the original story. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like I, I know I know it's trying to be the most faithful adaptation to the to the original story. But still, it's like you still gotta you still look at it and you go, Jesus. You know? Ooh, what the hell? Like, especially the transition from present to future, like you see San- you see like the ghost of Christmas present decaying and still laughing at the same time. So you see the skeleton just there is like he's dying, it's like You know, sparkles are harmless. Sparkles are pretty. Sparkles are harmless, sparkles are deadly. <laughs> <laughs> Polar Express, the holiday classic that scared the hell out of me. No, that's the Christmas Carol, or maybe it scared you with the Polar Express. I I didn't like I don't like motion capture to be honest. I just I thought I was like, what the fuck am I watching? This is not. The closest I got to being, the closest I got to being scared by the Polar Express was that one scene where they were like going over the railing, and it was like really high, and I being a little. Yeah. I thought it was like, oh no, don't fall, don't fall. Don't you're fall so, off. You're so, you're so... Oh yeah, like, is it that roller coaster scene? No, it's um. Well, that that looking back at it was pretty intense. Like, they 
gonna be sleep falling off that train. Yeah. <laughs> I thought Polar Express was pretty good. I thought it had some kind of pokey moments that I wasn't fond of. Like I wasn't, I didn't like the song, or or, or the the bit with the the girl who was like, "Are you sure?" And yeah. Sure. And that's the thing. The score. And, yes, I am sure. I'm sure. Yeah, and that's another thing I want to mention. The score. Like, I'm not really a huge fan because, like, me and my parents agree it's way too similar to Elf. Because, like, they both start very similar with the... Da, na, 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 na. But then suddenly it goes in another direction. Express eh? I don't know. But, like, I don't know. Like, like we were more fond of... Um, we were we were more fond of uh, Elf, so like we prefer that. Then the. The song was just hokey. Yeah. Like, Christmas is so whimsical. Speaking of which, oh yeah, speaking of which, why the fridge was there a Stevie a Steve Tyler Elf? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> that yeah, was. I'm on screen for like five seconds, so I don't know how much I can complain, but yeah, weird. That was weird. Yeah, it, it's just a, it's a, a weird film for me. It just I never could never could get into it. it just I rather prefer the book. I like the visual spectacle of it. I thought that the see moments were a little much. You know, Mandark is always appreciated. Like the book didn't have Mandark, Mike. Gotta admit that. Look, did not have Mandar. Touche. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Touche. Mm. So is that pretty much it with the Polar Express for us, or is there any more we can get into? That, my friends, is the end of the podcast. We talked and reminisced of 2004, 10 years ago. By God, does time go way too fast. And it's December, we're getting close to the end of 2014. Next year's going to be 2015. Holy crap. I'm, the next episode, I'm not going to give you a clue. You guys have to full-on guess what it is, and it's going to be a no-brainer. Yeah, you can know. Okay. I think, okay, I'm I might get yeah, yeah. You won't know. Sorry. What? Oh. Um, I think I might know. Audience, Matt. Was I talking to the fourth wall? I was talking to you guys. Oh! Oh, okay, it's not against me, it's, it was the audience. Oh, okay. Okay, I think I, I think I might know what it is. I think. You think? I Th think. think. Think about it. Just think about it. You, okay. I'll give you a clue. Oh no 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 no! Wait, no, actually, no no no! I... Oh, never mind. Wait a minute. I'm just... Oh no, wait. Hold on. I did the math. Oh, okay. No no no! I think no. I got it. No 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 no! Just think about it. Yeah, think, I think, I... think about what the last episode of 2014 would be. Yeah, exactly. And think, think about what we haven't done on Cinema Royale yet. I would know. I she That's wouldn't know fair. because. She doesn't know our extensive library. There's so many yeah. pots. You've made so many, you guys, and they're all like two, three hours long. I know. Well, sometimes it's not my fault. It's yeah, it's previous co-host. Sometimes it's not your fault, man. <laughs> hey, you don't know. You haven't seen the podcasts. This, this, this last I chunk. And what I assume, Matt, is that you. Well, I got, I got, hey, I got witness. I got witness, so. He can vouch for me. Yep. This whole last half is basically the next episode. Oh, you, oh wait, is that it? Whole last half. Okay, yeah. Next episode... I got it, I got We're it. going holiday festive with our first ever Christmas episode. Oh, okay. Oh, yay. Thank you. 
God, there are so many. Wouldn't the next episode be done like after Christmas though? December is a Christmas month. You uh, sell, you sell, you watch those Christmas specials no matter what. You watch those movies no matter what. People marathon that shit from beginning from December to all the way to the end of December. It doesn't matter if it's not on Christmas. I've got my tube already. I've got them. I'm not gonna say them out loud yet, but I got them. Wait. Oh, the Christmas movie. Right, right, right. Christmas. Well, I already covered one. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I was. That's. I. I segued it so perfectly for you guys. <laughs> Anyways, this is the second to the last episode. Um. Comment below of what you. What is your favorite 2004 film? What. What. Think about it. What. What did you experience in 2004? Leave a comment below. Like and make sure you subscribe for more Cinema Royale. Cause of course. I only have so many subscribers compared to Matt, because Matt is the man. He's got 27,000 subscribers. I mean, maybe if he, if we did a promo of the podcast on his channel and get the audience from Matt, and I would get more views, and it's a, it's a stretch. I mean... The, audience, do, the, okay? the audience is massive. I mean, I really ha All right. I, I'm successful. I only got 326 subscribers. That's not bad. That's not bad. I mean, it's, it's, it's a small market, but... Wait, wait, Mike. Before we go, I want I want to ask the audience another question. Can I ask the audience another question? You may. What is it called when Batman leaves church early? Oh, no. Christian... Don't do this. Christian Bale. Cinema Royale, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna laugh this way because I can't do this. Got Brent Christian. <laughs> well, there goes my dignity. <laughs> Christian. Christian. <laughs> Alright, see you guys. <laughs>